engineering from MIT. And much of Professor Larson's career has focused on operations research as applied to service industries, primarily in the fields of technology-enabled education, urban service systems, especially emergency response systems, queuing, logistics, and workforce planning. His first book, Urban Police Patrol Analysis, was awarded the Lanchester Prize of the Operations Research uh, Society of America. He is co-author with Amadeo Odoni of Urban Operations Research, a seminal textbook on operations research applied to urban planning. Professor Larson has served as consultant to numerous clients, including the World Bank, the United Nations, RAND Corporation, and the U.S. Department of Justice. He has been honored with the INFORMS President's Award for Contributions to Humanity through his work on the President's Crime Commission, his work with the New York City Police, Fire, Sanitation, and Ambulance Service, service and his work on 911 dispatching. He also received the Georgie e. Kimball Medal for Distinguished Service to, to INFORMS and to the profession. Today he will be discussing the importance of considering management and social science issues in the operations research process. Please welcome Dick Larson. Uh, thank you, Susan. Can, can everyone, I think everyone can hear me, because uh, with this microphone on, it's very, very nice. It seems to be working. It's a ple pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be invited and to participate in this. And uh, I see that this conference from our handouts has a rich history. And last year it was combinatorics, then before that scientific computing, before that geometry algebra, and something about some kind of trees, which I can't read. <laughs> And on and on and on. So, but this is the first one that focuses on really on operations research and operations research in a particular area. So that it's very nice to be involved in the first such one like that. And then also, the paper fairs were were quite interesting. And if I were to walk through that, I saw lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm, and lots of terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> lots of terrorism, balancing terrorism and natural disasters. And uh, the student there, who's now finished with his PhD, uh, Vicky Beer is a friend of mine, colleague, and was, uh, like you, uh, a PhD student at the OR Center at MIT. And then we have uh, optimization with uncertainties of location, allocation, medical supplies, and emergency situation. And then we have uh, challenges, OR, fire, and emergency, and on and on and on, and uh, including two that uh, your students are working on. So very, very, very interesting. Lots of good stuff in public sector OR. So today, uh, we're going to talk about kind of an eclectic number of applications in a, uh, a new home that I have at MIT. And uh, I have this awful title. It's too long, so let's forget about that title. And let's go. But you know, par part of it is operations research it can be thought of as something which applies the scientific method to complex problems, usually involving both technology and people. And uh, the people part has to recognize that people are not widgets and are not machines, but they have human emotions and there are various kinds of responses that people have in various situations. Now, in OR, first of all, if you, if you go to a reception, Somebody says, well, what do you do, Dr. Lars? I said, well, I'm an operations researcher. Nine times out of 10, people's eyes roll up in their heads and they don't know what you're talking about. You know, uh, uh, that's, you know, and maybe one times out of 10, oh, it's so nice those doctors in operating rooms really need people to do research on how to do their things better. And uh, it's, it's not that often that you, know, you, you, you find somebody, oh, I know exactly what you do. You are an OR, huh? So you're an optimizer. And so those who have heard about it trivialize and marginalize our profession and to think all we do is, is, is optimization. I'm, I'm overstating it to, to make a point. But really, the huge contribution of operations research, and I think we've seen this in the first two talks, is to properly frame a problem and formulate it and analyze it and in indicate what kind of decision should be made. Do, am I hearing some feedback in this, a little bit, little bit of feedback? Maybe they could just turn down the volume a little bit or something? So it is, you know, the response to humans and their reactions and their behavior are first order issues to, con to consider in, 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 much of, in much of what we do. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a, a lesson there. And then, you know, when our profession started, 
When our profession started, Philip M. Morse, a physicist from MIT, actually started operations research in this country in 1940, 1941, following some British colleagues who were also physicists. Morse wrote many articles, the first books in operations research, and, uh, and so he, he kind of framed out what it, what it would be and uh, applying the scientific method to these complex problems. But in recent decades, we've seen a tendency to make operations research very rigorous. And so I say that excess rigor can lead to rigor mortis, and there it is. <laughs> there it is. Rigor mortis, the irreversible stiffening of a profession caused by excessive fixation with rigor. You know, and, and, I, and there are many of my colleagues these days, not only at MIT but elsewhere, on faculties of OR-related departments, that count the number of theorems and proofs in, the, in a student's PhD thesis to know whether it's acceptable for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the doctorate. And if there are not enough theorems and proofs, then uh, certainly there's not enough o OR work done there and uh, cannot be accepted as a doctoral thesis in operations research. I would just caution, if you, look at, if you listen to the first two presentations here, Margaret's this morning and Arnie Barnett's uh, last evening, I don't think you heard too many times the statements theorem and proof. Now, if we go to our founding father, Philip M. Morse, who it was my honor to, to know during his last decade of, of service at, at, operation, uh, at MIT, uh, the first book that he wrote with Kimball, Methods of Operations Research, which I think was classified for about six years after World War II, and then finally released in about 1951 or so, he has various definitions or various descriptions of operations research. One is, operations research is an applied science utilizing all known scientific techniques as tools in solving a problem. That doesn't limit us to mathematics. Operations research uses mathematics, but is not a branch of mathematics. Okay. Operations research is often an experimental science as well as an observational one. And I really like this one. It basically says that sometimes the major contribution of an OR, what he calls OR worker, I love that, OR worker, is to decide what the real problem is because perhaps it was framed incorrectly in the first place, you know? And maybe we could, by reframing it, all of a sudden you say, ah, the answer is trivial, here it is. So we shouldn't forget our roots. Maybe it's my age and I'm kind of a retro guy, so maybe I like to go back to the 50s. But uh, and, and anyway, I, I find, you know, reading this and refreshing myself with, with some of these words uh, is inspiring. Now, if you look through Morse's papers, and his books on OR, he also wrote the first scholarly book on OR after this introduction, Cues, Inventories, and Maintenance, came out in 1955 or so. And if you also read all of his other books in thermal physics, acoustic physics, mathematical, theory, uh, mathematical methods of theoretical physics, Morse and Feshbach, it's about this thick. So the guy knew mathematics. I challenge you to find two words in those books, theorem and proof. So that's enough of that little lecture. Now, as an example of human behavior issues, uh, one of the pillars of operations research is queuing theory. We love to queue. Okay? I notice this is very well designed. There's not very much queuing outside. It's a very, very pleasant environment we have here. Well, in 1909 to about 1915 or so, uh, A.K. Erlang, which was a, who was a Danish telephone engineer, was given an assignment by his superiors. And basically, you know, the telephone, I think when it was originally invented, was two boxes and one wire. You know, you might want to call your neighbor next door, or if your mother-in-law lives in the third floor, you could call her or whatever. And then all of a sudden, the telephone became popular, and people realized you want to phone more than one person. And it doesn't scale to hang a wire from, every, from you to every person you ever want to call. That does, that's not a scalable solution. So they invented the central telephone switch. And you, it's, it's like the hub and spoke system in airlines. You, you go into the te telephone switch, they route your call, and out it goes. And so uh, Erlang's, uh, uh, was at, Erlang was asked by his superiors, figure out a science for determining what the capacity should be for our centralized telephone switch. Of course, they didn't have digital and silicon in those days, so it was a very much more primitive technology. 
and the thing is, if, if, if the switch was too big, uh, the company would, you know, no, no, no customers would experience any queuing delays or lost calls, but the company would have spent more on capital investment than necessary and maybe it turned up what could have been a profit into a loss. Not good for the shareholders. On the other hand, if the switch is too small, then there'd be a lot of lost calls or lack of connections, and the word would get out that this telephone system doesn't work. So there's a trade-off. And he invented things, and I actually, when I was on sabbatical in Denmark once, I actually held in my hand his original book, which had all of his original writings and derivations of what's now known as Erlang's formulas, and that was the birth of queuing physics in Denmark. And uh, the Danes are very proud of this. In fact, there's, there's a unit of measurement in science now called the Erlangs, the Erlang load onto a queuing system. I don't think we use it very often here in the US but they do in Denmark. I once had the embarrassment of giving a lecture on queuing theory in Denmark, and I was, wanted to be so, show how much I was with it. So I said, well, the load on this is 10 Erlangs. But I greatly insulted them, and they were very upset with me. Why? Because I capitalized E. If you think about watts and volts and amperes, it's all started with a small letter. So the ultimate distinction for a scientist, if you can have a unit of measurement named after you with a small letter. So maybe in the future, I doubt if in the future there'll be everything called Larsons. You know, we had a, a load of 12 Larsons on this, but with a small L. But anyway, Erlangs are with a small E, just for the word for the wise. Okay, so that was the birth of Q in physics. Erlang's formulas have stood the test of time. They're often still the most widely used in applications although I would say at least 10,000 research articles have been written on queuing theory since then, and many of them quite useful and, and having a, a, a substantial changes, result in substantial changes in service systems. And there's still a very active research in, in queuing, as, as there should be. But going back to Philip Morris's idea that sometimes the best contribution of OR is defining the problem, we had in the mid-1950s uh, the post-World War II boom it created uh, building booms in New York City and elsewhere. A lot of people's lives became high-rise lives. They were living in high-rise apartments, going to work in high-rise buildings. Maybe they had friends visiting the city in high-rise hotels. And around 1954, 55 or so, people started complaining about rush hour delays waiting for elevators in some of these buildings. They called Russ Acoff. Uh, at uh, the uh, at University of Pennsylvania, and he sent a, one of his junior assistants there to look into this. And the junior assistant was looking at it, and he says, yeah, there's rush hour delays, you know, like 9, 8.30 in the morning or 5 o'clock at night, depending on what kind of building it is, et cetera, that if you, uh, you know, you ask for elevator service. And in those days, a lot of the elevators had their own operators. This is before digital, digitally operated elevators, and so each one had its own pilot, m many of them and you didn't have sophisticated chips to indicate how the movement should be optimized. And, uh, but just like there are rush hour delays and on, on, with taxi cabs and subways and buses, there were rush hour delays for elevators. So the narrowly technocratic OR scientist might say, hmm, this four elevator shaft building should be dynamited and, uh, and, and replaced by an eight elevator shaft building because the number of parallel servers is not sufficient to meet peak rush hour demand. So uh, let's get rid of the building, destroy it, and start over again. Well, Russ Acoff's person, whose name he does not remember, and this is, a, this is folk art that goes back into the history of OR, and we don't have the name of this person who came up with this great insight. Basically, he said, ah, perhaps the problem is not the delays waiting for elevators during these periods, it's the complaints about the delays. If we could reduce the complaints about the delays to near zero, problem solved. And then in a burst of lateral thinking and creativity, he said, well, we need to entertain and distract people some way. What if we put floor to ceiling mirrors next to all the elevators in an experimental building? So they did that, and they noticed the complaints about elevator delays in that building dropped to near zero. Problem solved, and the queuing delay statistics unchanged. So there's the, that's one of those elevators. Well, that's, that's even a more modern elevator. Oh, there it goes. So, and, that, and, and that basically, to me, is classic operations research. 
Now, I would claim that today, if that paper were written up and submitted to one of our esteemed scholarly journals, it would be rejected. Because how many theorems were proved? How many equations were there? How many variables? Zero. How much common sense thinking and lateral thinking? A lot. Interestingly, that was about 1955. We're not too far from Anaheim here. In the same year, what opened up? Disneyland. And the Disney properties have now become the Machiavellian experts in the psychology of queuing. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, in fact, they employ, just down in Orlando, they employ somewhere between 15 and 20 Imagineers. Uh, these, are, uh, these are people who have uh, industrial engineering and or operations research degrees to, uh, to help design and optimize their facilities. And so since, the, so that was kind of, I call that in 1955 kind of the birth of the psychology of queuing. And we have many examples, and I've written about this, and that's not the focus today. But, uh, but the psychology of queuing, to me, should be in the arsenal of tools that an OR person uses, as well as the mathematics and the physics of queuing. Because both are important, and sometimes one is more important than the other. But to exclude psychology because it's a soft science or because it's social science, uh, I think is negligent and could be re really result in, 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 in poor research and poor recommendations, poor decision recommendations. An example, before the Bell system was split up because of antitrust issues uh, and before cellular telephones, so we're going way back into the mid last century or something, but a lot of people then had landline telephones. My, my, I'm blessed with three children. They're all in their 20s. They all have cell phones, and I think that none of them ever will have a land-based telephone in their house, apartment, condo, or wherever they live. But in a land-based telephone, the uh, AT&T Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, once one of the finest research labs on the planet, wanted to really do a scientific investigation about the queuing system that should be implemented when you pick up a telephone looking for a dial tone. Now, you might not realize that when you pick up a telephone and, li and listen for a dial tone, that you're entering a queuing system. Uh, ask the people who tried to use their cell phones after the Oklahoma City bombing or the terrorist attacks in London. I know there's a lot of issues here. A lot of, people, a lot of you are interested in terrorist attacks. Well, the cell phone systems are one of the first things to go after any such attack. 911, another example, 9-11. So, but we're not talking about that, those particular things, but that, that's an example where there might be a large surge of calls way beyond the usual average. So here's a damsel in distress who's calling. And so basically, the uh, Bell Laboratories spent over a year researching this and well over a million dollars in 1970s money. And they said that basically they implemented in their system a two-priority queue. The two-priority queue, so you pick up the telephone and you enter a two-priority queue. You en and priority two is less important than priority one. You enter a last-come, first-served priority two system, and if you are still without a dial tone after 15 seconds, you shift immediately to a priority one, first-come, first-served queue, and uh, no priority two customers are served when the priority one queue is not empty. So basically, you pick up the telephone, and if you're patient enough to wait for 15 seconds with no, no, no dial tone, all of a sudden they shift you up to priority one, first come, first serve. You get right through, usually because that's a very small queue, and you get the dial tone. And anyone who's, who tries a phone call at that time gets delayed in the priority two queue. Now, you might ask, <clears throat> who in the world would design a queuing discipline like this? Would you ever like to go to a supermarket or an In-N-Out burger? one of my favorite fast food restaurants if we don't have it in the East Coast, or some other service facility where it's last come, first serve, but priority two, and if you wait too long, you're bumped up to priority one, first come, first serve. That, that sounds crazy. Can anyone here think about why this not, might not be so crazy and why this is the result of rigorous scholarly research involving both technology, mathematics, and human behavior? Any volunteers? I can see you, so if anyone raises your hand, I can see, I can. 
But why don't we, why don't we, why don't we hold that until, ah, why don't we hold that to the end? And we'll, if we have some time, you, you, can, you can volunteer your, your thoughts. But I'll just say this. <clears throat> uh, implementing that has been great for 911 calls that are over landline telephones and has saved lives. So I'll give you that as the hint, and you can think about that uh, over the next few minutes. Now, today's focus is, you know, we're, this is work in progress. We're kind of in the year two of full operation of a new uh, center at MIT that I'm the founding director of Center for Engineering Systems Fundamentals. Um, symbolically and literally, it's on the floor at MIT in a building right above the Operations Research Center. So the Operations Research Center, which I know and love and actually was a co-director for many years, but this is different. So this is basically in uh, uh, MIT's new division, which is called the Engineering Systems Division. The Engineering Systems Division actually can uh, uh, appoint faculty, a 10-year slot faculty, um, and this division operates horizontally above all the silos that are the various departments in the School of Engineering, civil and environmental engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, aeronautics and astronautics, nuclear, et cetera. So this covers all, goes across all those and into the Sloan School of Management and the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. So we like to say that this uh, engineering systems division and this little uh, center that I started, the Center for Engineering Systems Fundamentals, uh, operates at the Venn diagram intersection of engineering, and you could say this is OR or IE here, management and, 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 and social science. And so we like to think about complex systems problems that, uh, that involve all three, and, and we don't necessarily artificially exclude any of those. So we want to identify and extract what is the so-called fundamental concepts and methodologies <coughs> And just like OR, we think that this should be research on real problems, and, and, and from the real problems, hopefully we can extract fundamentals. And I would claim for the, to the OR community, and I know there are some of you here who have been involved not quite as long as I have, but you know, for many years, that if you think about the fundamental theoretical constructs of OR, at least 90% of them were first derived from people working on real problems. Not somebody going up to a blackboard and saying, mm, I wonder if I can prove a theorem about this today. And all of a sudden, they come up with some new thing. No, all the, all the major things, including um, dynamic programming, linear programming, queuing theory, search theory, and many other things were uh, created by looking at real problems. Let me look at Erlang's issue with the Copenhagen Telephone Company as an example. <clears throat> so we're trying to do the same thing, look at real problems, and uh, wearing my engineering hat at the end, we want to design and build something. And so how do we derive fundamentals? We work on real problems. And the kind of student we're trying to create in the doctoral program there is what I would call a T-person. A, a T-person is, is somebody who is deep in one or more methodologies. That might be the vertical cut there. And equally knowledgeable <coughs> about a particular domain or application. And, and we've seen, uh, I think, our two previous speakers, I think their doctoral students are, are, are wonderful tea people. With Arnie, it's, it's, it's somebody who is, a, a, his students tend to be very knowledgeable about uh, operations research, particularly statistics and, and, prob and applied probability, and equally knowledgeable about uh, airlines and airline safety. And with Margaret, you could see it was a similar thing, but in these infectious diseases. So, uh, they are graduating T people, uh, some of whom are in the audience today. <laughs> and so we're trying to do a similar kind of thing. And if we're successful, uh, these um, uh, PhD graduates will be able to publish in two kinds of refereed journals, both the methodology journal and in the application or context of do or domain uh, journal. So that's our focus. And uh, this center is, is small but emerging, and I just thought I'd touch on some of the research topics we're talking about, and they exist at the Venn diagram intersection of, let's say, OR, IE, management and social science. And in some vague sense, they all relate to infrastructure. So, uh, and uh, when I say OR narrowly defined, you'll see what I mean. So each has that and, and management and social science. So the first one is basically 
And around 1982 or something, the early 80s, the US airline industry was deregulated, and airlines like People's Express came along, which had uh, severe discounts compared to, let's say, American Airlines or United, and uh, the traditional airlines had to figure out how to survive this kind of competition, and so they figured out that they could sell adjacent seats in the cabin of the aircraft, maybe at an order of magnitude difference in price, and get away with it. And they called it yield management, and it's now called revenue management or dynamic pricing. It's basically that you can shift the price for things based on demand and service, and, and you, you segment the, the marketplace, and these sorts of things. Well, these ideas now are being applied in many, many areas. They're being applied in many, many service uh, uh, sectors, and now in infrastructure. So. We have one of our projects, which has been funded by two or three different sources. The key source now is the, is the government of Portugal, which is probably leading the European Union in terms of renewable energy um, and, and microgrid designs and, and these sorts of things. So basically the issue of how do you overcome uh, uh, congestion in infrastructure systems and uh, particularly uh, the issue of uh, electricity demand <coughs> during, let's say, hot days in July and August. And so um, Dan Liebengood, I like to pronounce his name Livengood, but he always, cor he always corrects me, it's Liebengood, uh, is, is my old senior uh, doctoral student on this, and I have a, uh, there's another one uh, recently he's joined us. And so we have kind of a team going on here. But the idea here with applying demand-sensitive pricing to electricity, and we're projecting a world, which you may or may not like, but we're projecting a world in which there's spot pricing of electricity and that perhaps the electricity price changes on a five minute to five minute interval. And as the demand goes up, the price goes up, and as the demand goes down, the price goes down. Maybe it goes as if some kind of periodic Markov process. You could, you, could, you could study this and study the statistics. And suppose that each person in their home or apartment or condo and small business has something called an energy box. And the energy box is filled with OR inside, that invisibly and automatically, without human uh, 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 intervention, will optimize the use of your own electricity within your lifestyle constraints, cost preferences, utility functions, and what have you. And the idea is to shave the peak demand and fill in the valleys of demand to the extent possible within all those constraints. And this idea goes back into the 1980s and, uh, and, and some theses that were done at that time, one of them was by Panos Constantopoulos, an OR student at MIT that I co-supervised with uh, uh, Fred Schweppe, who unfortunately uh, passed away shortly after this thesis was, was done. And, and uh, they figured, we, uh, 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 Constantopoulos, working with us, figured out how to use stochastic dynamic programming. See, so optimization is here. Stochastic dynamic programming to uh, adjust when the thermos goes on or the air conditioning goes on and off, the, the, the electric wa water heater, if you got that, and other things to reduce electricity consumption during peaks, to fill it in during valleys. And if you did that, if we did that collectively and you had a large market share in these kind of e energy boxes being, being produced and, 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 and utilized, uh, you could significantly reduce these peaks, fill in the valleys, and if you reduce the peaks in the short term, you reduce the need to turn on the oldest, highest polluting electricity power generating plants. And we did a back of the envelope calculation. Margaret, thank you for uh, saying the back of the envelope calculations. If you want to take it to an extreme as a thought process, suppose you could flatten out the energy demand over the course of 24 hours and 365 days a year. You can't do that. But just suppose you could. You wouldn't have to build in the United States another energy producing power plant for 17 years. So this is definitely a first order effect. And it's a low-hanging fruit, and everyone's talking about wind power and solar and waves and thermal and everything. But if you can adjust the demands a little bit over the course of 24 hours, uh, you can have many of these savings um, and, and sometimes uh, multiples of those uh, just by that. So that's what that's looking at right now. And um, you can say, well, well, is there math in inside? Well, you know, what, what's going on here? Yes, dynamic pricing theory, stochastic dynamic programming, data mining, forecasting, and much more. And this energy box idea that we have is we want to create a software architecture for something that could exist on a special purpose computer, or better yet, on your, laptop, uh, on your desktop PC or Macintosh, which would you never turn off beyond 24-7 in your house, which you, you could set up your, your utility function or your volume controls you know, when you install it. 
And then this thing would exist as a background processor managing your electricity in a very intelligent way. And we make it an open source with the hooks, the software hooks indicated, and people from around the world could produce programs for it, programs to manage your electricity usage. And the market then would determine which ones are bought or licensed, or you, you, some of these might even be given away. And you could install whatever subset of these programs under your energy box architecture you like, and it would affect the, the uh, uh, energy use in your house. So that's the idea. That's what's going on there. And there are about five students, five doctoral students working on that, and we also have a team of partners in Portugal. Now, um, congestion pricing. Congestion pricing, you might have heard of this recently. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York wants to propose a, has proposed a tax. I think the last time I looked at it was $8 per day for any car or v other vehicle that goes into Manhattan, I think south of 86th Street, between about 6 a.m. and about 6 p.m. It was very controversial in Albany. They debated it and blah, blah, blah. And there were hundreds of millions of dollars of federal money at stake. Anyway, it's still alive, and the money, a, lot of, a big chunk of money has come. And the idea is if you propose a congestion tax for using resources like the freeways in Los Angeles during b busy periods, you might be able to uh, reduce uh, d uh, the, the use of these facilities. You might get, be get a, a people to carpool. You might uh, defer discretionary trips. Um, you might uh, delay trips to the off-peak hours, and these sorts of things. So we have uh, people who are looking at this, and there's a rich history now. Singapore started this, and they're the world-class people. Uh, 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 the city, Singapore City, has been doing this successfully for years. Most recently, London, with a totally different and more obsolete technology, has cordoned off part of central London and charges a huge fee. Uh, Stockholm uh, is doing this right now, and they had actually had a vote to do this, and and there are others. Some histories were not so successful, and others were. And so we have a paper which is uh, about to be submitted to Transportation Science on this. And uh, we're taking a rather contrarian point of view. After we're looking at all the history of congestion pricing in cities, it's a classic case of urban operations research, you might say, well, what is the real issue here? What is the real problem? Let's frame this problem. The, the problem is there are too many cars driving around on our streets uh, during business hours. Well, it's been found by folks, including people here in the West Coast, that in some regions and some cities, 25 to 50 percent of the moving cars, and I think we were one last night looking for a parking space for dinner, 25 to 50 percent of the moving cars in the core city are cruising around looking for inexpensive on-street parking. Now, beca why? Because the on-street parking might be 25 or 50 cents an hour, maybe a dollar an hour, whereas the off-street parking will be an order of magnitude or more and more than that. And so, therefore, those of us who want to minimize costs, and that's, that's most of us, we are willing to cruise around and, and look for that cheap on-street parking. Well, my co-author, who was born in Japan, uh, is quite familiar with the case of Tokyo and other major uh, cities, and they had the same problem. And instead of cordoning off part of the city with, with expensive uh, and taxing, and I mean that in two ways, uh, uh, congestion pricing schemes as being, has been in, done in London and Singapore, they just banned on-street parking, totally, in the center cities. Guess what? Statistically, they got the same reduction in moving automobile traffic as has been measured in Singapore and London. So we're taking a slightly different point of view, and so our, our paper really focuses on a, a brand new queuing model, which models, I think, fairly com in a very compelling way. I think it's a medium complexity model, so that I think John Calkins would like that, medium complexity model, that actually models people going around looking for parking, and then eventually, they, if they don't succeed, they get disappointed, and they renege from the queue, they, they renege from the queue, and then shell out some real money in an off-street uh, garage or, 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 or parking lot. So that's an example of, of that kind of transportation infrastructure. We have an emerging uh, area looking at queuing. So queuing is one of the pillars of operations research. We love queuing. And my colleague is a, a Russian-born mathematician, now a US citizen, Alexander Belinky, who's actually, by the way, one of the world's experts on the US Constitution and US presidency. He just finished his third book on this. 
I find that interesting, a Russian-born mathematician who's done this, and he's actually consulted to U.S. presidential <laughs> candidates. I don't know if he's doing that right now for the current set of candidates. So uh, we're focusing on queuing in U.S. elections. For instance, in Ohio in 2004, there are about 20 active lawsuits uh, that are claiming that the amount of queuing service resources, personnel and voting machines, were manipulated by one party to, in, in districts where the other party had the majority of voting registrants in order to make long queues to discourage those people from voting. It's kind of a stealth disenfranchisement. Because if you get to a voting a, a, a facility and you see that the queuing delay is going to be you know, two hours or so, you may decide, well, I've got to go home and cook, uh, 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 cook dinner for the kids, or I've got to get to work, or something like this. I can't do that. There was one college in Ohio where I think they kept the, uh, the voting open to 4 a.m. because they had, one, uh, they had one voting machine, and they had a lot of students who wanted to vote, and uh, so they kept it to 4 a.m. Anyway, so these are the lawsuits. We've been talking to people doing these lawsuits and uh, trying to help as mediators. And uh, our push is, and we're talking to some foundations where I think we're close to being uh, funded here, is to create a national standard for, uh, for the maximum acceptable queuing delay uh, on voting day. If you, if you imagine, I mean, in, in a democracy like this, is there a more important queue that you join and a, a more important service than voting for the President of the United States every four years? I don't think so, and yet there's no science of operations research brought to this, and every voting district is on their own, and they don't know about all the things that can go wrong in queuing systems, and it also leaves it up to uh, uh, criticism that there might be deliberate manipulation to, to foster stealth, the, the stealth disenfranchisement. And so in some of this stuff, um, w and I know Margaret and, and Arnie Barnett are also activists in this area, we write op-ed pieces, and I think we've written two op-ed pieces on this particular thing. And actually, there was also an article at ORMS Today, if any of you read that uh, magazine, about this, uh, about this issue. So another example of what we're doing is in the healthcare area. We've heard a lot about healthcare this morning. Pandemic influenza, which I think in the last century still is the worst pandemic in the history of the world in the, la in the last 100 years. Uh, it, the, we'll never know for sure, but the 1918-1919 flu pandemic, incorrectly labeled the Spanish influenza. Spanish were innocent, they had nothing to do with this. This was born in Kansas, as far as we can tell. It should be called the Kansas flu. Killed anywhere from 20 to 100 million people worldwide in the course of uh, less than a year. 600, only 650,000, I say only. Of that many, many tens of millions, 650,000 of those were American citizens. And um, a lot of those were healthy young people who, of college age and into their, uh, through their 20s. So it, it, was, a, it was a tragedy. 650,000 people dead in a few months because of the flu. At the end of World War I, more soldiers on both sides were dying of influenza than of bullets and bombs. And uh, the 650,000, you know, I don't know, I never read about this in my, in my high school American history. Until recently, this has been an invisible blip in American history, and yet the 650,000 is more American deaths than all the wars of the 20th century. And, and we hadn't heard about it. Until, you know, I was, you know, I've, I've been in Boston all my adult life, and 1918 in Boston had a religious fervor to it, because before the year 2004, 1918 was the last time the Red Sox won the World Series. Little did I know that Boston was the urban epicenter of the worst pandemic flu to occur in many, many decades. Because the, that's, that's the first city that really got it. And in mid-October, in Boston, over 200 people were dying per day. So I ask you this important question. If the Red Sox were in Fenway Park playing the World Series, the, the boys of October... Were they doing this when 200 people were dying per day of, uh, of the so-called Spanish flu? I don't think they'd labeled it the Spanish flu at that time. Well, being curious, I wanted to resolve this complexity because I'm a member of Red Sox Nation, and I would join no nation that would, uh, that would behave that way. Well, at the end, of, I found out that it was, since it was World War I, there was an abbreviated baseball season. 
And the World Series occurred early in September, right after Labor Day weekend. And so I can still be a proud member of Red Sox Nation because Fenway Park was unused during October, the, the time that the pandemic peaked in, 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 in Boston. Anyway, ah, Red Sox Nation's very happy today. They clinched the uh, American League East pennant yesterday. I knew you wanted to know that. By the way, one of my favorite questions for undergraduate probability uh, students is, you have a World Series, that's a best of, best of seven. What's the probability that the inferior team wins as a function of the level of inferiority of that team? That's always an interesting question. So anyway, here's, here's some of our uh, crew for uh, the pandemic influenza. This is sponsored by IBM and the Sloan Foundation. And uh, our first paper on this was published in the May-June issue of Operations Research. Maybe one or two of you have seen this. Our second paper with my student, Karima, is about to be submitted to some journal. We have to figure out exactly where that's going to go. And um, we're also uh, trying to be uh, uh, advocates here, too. So, you know, I wrote this op-ed piece and submitted it to the Boston Globe. Well, they didn't like it. It wasn't sufficient for their politics. And I submitted it to the New York Times. They didn't like it either. So I submitted it to the Boston Herald, which is, you know, a tabloid type thing. And usually, if you get something published, they, 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 they confirm you and that as, as, as if, you know, you make sure you're a, a, a legitimate author and everything. Well, the next day it was published without even me knowing about it. And, and, and five days later, I received a check in the mail for $150 as my author's fee. I thought that was very, very nice. Very, very nice of them. Nation ill-prepared for the flu. I wrote this in October of 2005. So we've been working on this for a while. And you know, what about fundamentals? I've talked to Margaret about this. There's something in epidemiology in the, in the mathematical literature called R0. And we have a big problem with R0 when it comes to respiratory infectious diseases like a flu pandemic. Uh, there is this H5N1 virus, which is going around the world, been going around the world for now for eight or nine years, and uh, it's killed uh, tens of millions of birds and uh, a few hundred people. Luckily for us, it isn't human-to-human -human efficiently transmittable yet. Um, the measured reported fatality rate of this, if you get it, is 60%, but I think that's a, a huge overestimate because those are only of people who have reported themselves to to uh, certified medical uh, professionals. There are a lot of people, we believe, that have gotten it and, 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 and either died without medical people knowing it or, or rec self-recovered and not reported. So the, the, the problem, we have a problem again of the numerator and the denominator in, in that 60% fatality rate. But even if it drops down to one or 2%, which was typical of the so-called Spanish flu, 1918, 1919, we have a problem. And <coughs> should a flu of that magnitude hit again, uh, the potential number of deaths worldwide is in the order of 200 to 300 million people, unless we are careful and, and do things about it. So it's potentially uh, worse, off, worse than a full nuclear exchange between two nuclear powers. So, so that's, that's why we look at this. We think it's a low probability, high consequence event, like many of the terrorist things we're talking about here. And um, so operations research, we think, can, can play a role. So we have this R0. R0 is defined to be the mean number of new infections created by a recently infected individual until that individual is isolated from the population at the early part of the pandemic, when ev virtually everybody is susceptible. So for instance, if R0 were 10, and if I'm patient zero, and unfortunately, I'm patient, so I'm the first one to get it from a pig or a bird or whatever, and now it's mutated, so it's human to human efficiently transmittable. And if R0 is 10, that means on average, I would give it to 10 more people until I'm isolated in a, in a, in a hospital or something like this. Okay. Now, clearly, if R0 is greater than 1 in this concept, we're going to have exponential increase in the number, for at least for a while, in the number of people who are infected. And if R0 is less than 1, we have geometric decay, and the thing eventually goes away. OK, so, but we don't like R0. And you know, I have these debates with people, and a, a lot of folks who, who apply this in practice in mathematical modeling view R0 as an, a fixed numerical input to a mathematical model of infectious diseases, like pandemic influenza. And they treat it with great certainty, like, well, 
We model this with a $300 million, a $300 million agent simulation model on these supercomputers, and R0 was 2.160032. Well, um, you know, like a gravitational constant or some other constant of nature. We believe that R0 really is a product of other things, and these other things are, uh, uh, in some sense, controllable by us. It's the number of people you interact with on a face-to-face -face basis every day, and the conditional probability that if you're infectious, you're going to give it to somebody on one of these face-to-face -face encounters. And so therefore, it's like R0 is lambda times P, where lambda is the number of, uh, average number of people you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, P is the conditional probability of transmitting the infection. And of course, uh, these things will change depending on what type of person it is and what the environment is. But by treating R0 as a fixed constant of nature, in framing the problem in Morse's view at the beginning, you preclude focusing on lambda and p, because you're treating R0 as a constant. So from a policy point of view, that framing of the problem, I think, is deeply flawed. It's also a population average, and then suffers from all problems of uh, averages depicting populations. And uh, it really scientifically pertains only to the index patient, and can be proven to be incorrect. Because suppose uh, there is a new infectious disease which has just mutated and is now uh, officially transmittable from person to person. And suppose I'm patient zero, and I get it. Well, there is a probability distribution as to the number of people I will infect. And there's a positive probability that that number is zero. So a pandemic has started, and the number is one who got it, me. And that's going to be a blip that no one's going to ever recognize. So there are some pandemic, and you would never call it a pandemic, you wouldn't call it an epidemic. But in terms of the mathematical modeling, the, the equations, the system started, but it stopped because of self-extinction. So because of self-extinction, the pandemics that we can actually see and measure are those which didn't have self-extinction. So it's like a branching process that never goes into state zero collectively for the, 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 the set that have gotten it before, so it's conditionally those who have not gone into state, it's, it, it's those pandemics that have never gone into state zero of self-extinction. And therefore, you can prove, actually, that the conditional number of new infections that, that would be generated from patient zero, or even in the next generation, uh, if the, 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 the ones infected by patient zero, would be more than, uh, than R0. Because R0 has to include a probability mass at, at zero. So even the definition of R0 is wrong on measurable uh, pandemics. It's been my impression that lots of people love R0 because you can prove theorems about it. So therefore, we have to worry about rigor mortis. And then the, uh, the final thing is that these viruses tend to mutate during the course of the, the, the evolution of, of, of the pandemic in uncertain ways. So you have <coughs> a dynamic probabilistic system evolving here that has emergent properties. And so therefore, you can't have the luxury of thinking that even if you know what these parameters are, that they'll stay fixed during the, during the uh, duration. So where is the math inside here? Simple probabilistic models, branching processes, Markov processes, Markov decision processes, simulation, and more. So there is math here, and we're working on it. Uh, we've got two more examples. Real quick, uh, a student of mine, uh, Mike Metzger, is working on hurricane preparedness and response strategies. If you think about it, some hurricane with a, a, a male name or a female name is headed toward the east coast, or it could be called a typhoon or a cyclone headed to uh, other coasts around the world. And you've got a whole sequence of decisions. It's an action timing decision kind of problem about how do you activate resources, pre-position supplies and personnel, and order issue evacuation orders. And each of these decisions you can consider as a vector because you know you could probably going to evacuate people from hospitals and nursing homes before people who have SUVs who, who can leave their houses. And so he's looking at that, and he spent the whole summer working with people who predict hurricanes and, 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 and provide these guidances. Um, and he's bringing in the social science as well as the mathematics. The mathematics is stochastic dynamic programming, the Bellman equations. This is the formal theory of how you make decisions over time in an evolving probabilistic environment. This problem suffers from the so-called curse of dimensionality in the sense that the state space becomes exponentially large. <coughs> You've got that problem. You've got the, so he's got to wrestle that one to the ground. 
you've got the problem, too, that even with today's much improved prediction possibilities, pr probabilities for where the eye of the hurricane will hit when it uh, hits, the, let's say, the North Carolina coast or, some, or someplace in, in Florida or whatever, 24 hours out, 50% of the time you're going to be wrong in terms of a 125-mile swath about where the, where the eye is going to hit. So and 24 hours out is the last possible time you can issue a major evacuation order. After that, it's too late. So you have psychology in here. It's called the boy who cries wolf syndrome because the best you can do is be right half the time. That means half the time you're going to be wrong. So he's one chapter in his thesis, which is already done, has no equations, no theorems, no proofs, no parameters. It's all on the history of the boy who cries wolf syndrome in other areas of emergency response and what people have done to it. Because the, the population will become cynical and hardened if, you have, if they see too many false alarms. Ex uh, evacuations are inconvenient, expensive, exasperating, and uh, if they're issued too often, and in fact, retrospectively, you didn't need it, uh, that causes a problem. So he's gonna try to bring that, parameterize that, and bring that into the model itself. There's also a reverse uh, boy who cries wolf problem, Looking at what happened with uh, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina and the lack of a successful evacuation there, when Hurricane Rita hit uh, near the Galveston uh, part of Texas, the mayor of Houston went ballistic and said, get out of the city! But Houston was not in trouble, and Houston was not really asked to evacuate by the hurricane experts, but the people in Houston got on the highways, got on the interstates, clogged the roads, and those who really had to evacuate uh, faced traffic jams worse than the I-10 here. And some of them um, were discouraged and went, went home. So there's a reverse boy who cries wolf syndrome too, and that they see if the population sees what happens when you don't evacuate and then they're hit, then the next time, uh, the, the, the next time a hurricane hits, it, you're going to be hypersensitive the other way. Last thing is we're doing something on e-learning. Okay? So each of these things has math inside, so I want you to know there's, there's math in there. So eLearn, we have something called LINK, Learning International Networks Consortium. This is something we started in 2001, and it's an all-volunteer effort at MIT. And we've had people from other universities involved as well, in the US and, and overseas. And uh, we're looking at particularly developing countries and leveraging technology to bring quality education to underserved communities, particularly in developing countries. That's what LINK is all about. We have a LINK faculty advisory board that, cover, that has faculty from all five schools at MIT. So again, here, here's the idea of, of, you know, of, of people, students and faculty can be advocates. So it's not just that you, you know, sit down and, 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 and write papers, but you outreach and you try to interact and change the world in an active way as well as a scholarly way. <coughs> and that's an example of this. And kind of the, uh, the central theme of... Uh, of LINK is that with today's computer and telecommunication technologies, every young person can have a quality education regardless of his or her place of birth. These are four young people in a middle school in Ningxia province, in the center of, of China, one of the uh, poorest uh, uh, provinces. It's a semi-autonomous zone uh, in the center of China. These, their fathers tend to be peasant farmers whose cash crop every year is worth a couple hundred dollars. Um, it's mid-30s outside in Fahrenheit, but it's late October, and by law in China, you can't turn on the heat in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in schools until November 15th. So you see that they're wearing um, three layers of clothing to stay warm. There are two incandescent lights hanging from uh, the ceiling, but thanks to some Hong Kong donors, they have modern computers and are studying a biology lesson, which is the same lesson that their student counterparts in much richer um, Beijing and Shanghai are studying uh, uh, that week as well. And you notice how um, focused they are. I took this picture and they, I didn't bother them at all. They were totally focused and involved with this, this education. This uh, uh, was beamed down from a geosynchronous satellite uh, to this school. So that's an example of where you can bring quality educational experiences and learning environments to folks who ordinarily would not have access to this. So we've been doing this, and we're having our fourth uh, International Link Conference, our first one away from MIT, actually next month, a uh, bi-located conference in Amman, uh, Jordan, actually at the Dead Sea, and in Dubai. 
And um, they're quite excited about uh, that, MIT having a conference in e-learning in this region. The patron of the conference in Jordan is Her Majesty Queen Rania, Princess Samaya, who founded the Princess Samaya University of Technology in Amman, will be uh, session chair for one of the parallel sessions. And uh, we have these ministers of higher education involved as well. And we even have sponsors from flight companies like Pfizer and Intel and, and others. And you might say, well, what does OR have to do with education? What does OR have to do with education? And I would cite, and I know time is running out, so I, I won't be too long here, an invention called CyberTutor, which uh, MIT physics professor David Pritchard and his son invented. And CyberTutor is like a piece of software which acts as a full-time TA looking over your shoulder as you are trying to solve an OR problem or a mathematics problem or an engineering problem. Some problem which is stated and then it has a sequence, a logical sequence of steps to get to the right answer. Now, not, most problems don't have a right or wrong answer. But these, you know, these are the homework problems you have or the exam problems you have. And <clears throat> CyberTutor will say, depending on the volume controls and preferences you set up for it, say, ah, oh, did, you, did, you did you forget a minus sign there? As you're going through and solving the problem, you type in, in your solution into the computer, and CyberTutor tracks you. Uh, or it can note the, uh, the conceptual errors. Are, are you confusing angular velocity and angular momentum? Two different concepts. And so CyberTutor actually has been patented and sold and, 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 and now is actually uh, exists as a CD to help people do some of the homework problems in, in, in books, in engineering, in OR, mathematics, et cetera. <coughs> what is it? It's a huge decision tree. Any given problem takes about eight hours of an expert to program up all the branches that a student could do, and there are many, there are many more inaccurate, uh, uh, you know, erroneous branches that a student could go down rather than the, 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 the correct paths and put in error messages and, and dialogue at that time. But once you program it, the marginal cost of, of, of having 10 million students use it rather than 10 is zero. So CyberTutor, the, the basic core of CyberTutor inside is an OR decision tree. Well, it's an OR probabilistic sample space, if you like with action consequences at, at key nodes. Uh, don't have time to talk about guided learning pathways. One could use network theory to figure out in a developing country how to design the e-learning network that goes out and serves the population. Or Ken Chelst, a former doctoral student at MIT a long time ago in OR, and now at Wayne State University, just last month got awarded a $3 million grant. This is huge. A $3 million grant to do what? to use e-learning and face-to-face -face learning to create a new high school math elective in operations research, and uh, North Carolina has pledged to use it and bring it into most of their high schools. I find this very, very exciting. I think Colorado is also involved with this, and other states are looking at this very, in a very interesting way. The idea is that operations research can be the key to keep mathematically talented students in high schools interested in mathematics. Because all of a sudden they say, well, you know, if you, just, if you just learn math as a bunch of theorems and proofs, you say, well, how does this affect my life and, and, and the life of my friends and loved ones? Well, you could see, I think, I think at this conference, all the different things that OR can apply to. And we're just giving a small sample set today. So Ken Chelston and his team are going to create an entire academic year course as a math elective uh, for North Carolina, perhaps Colorado, and it's going to be generalized. A NSF is funding it. And uh, this could have a huge impact on keeping students, young women as well as young men, in, in, uh, focused on, on mathematics so they could see what, the, what it can do. So that's what uh, OR has to do with education. Now, I've talked about how this OR inside, and I've talked about the math, but if you, view, if you look at Phil Morris's definition of OR, Phil Morris would say, well, we, have, we need multidisciplinary teams. We have to consider the entire problem. So yes, there's math modeling in it, there's mathematics, but OR is not mathematics, it's not a branch of mathematics. There's issues of management and there's issues of social science. Morse's original teams had psychologists and, and, and others who, who were from social science. So in my view, all this that we're trying to do really is OR, as, at least as designed in the retro era of the 1940s and 50s. So I thank you very much for your attention and uh, open for questions. Thank you.
Sure. Um, so Tyler Med College is, is focused on training scientists, engineers, and mathematicians who have a broad understanding of the humanities and social sciences, um, specifically for this region of understanding how their, their work impacts society. So if you had any recommendations for faculty and students, both at Harvard Med and, and elsewhere, of how they can you know, bring issues of management and social sciences into their work, you know, how, would, how would you recommend people go about doing that? Oh, that's an excellent question, and that, that depends, of course, on many things, like how much time you have, uh, can they take a whole course in this, uh, what the resources are, what the environment is. But one way to do it is to have a practicum or uh, some kind of experience, either, e either during the academic year or as a, uh, as a summer internship somewhere, where they work on real problems with real clients, and, 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 and the decision recommendations have real consequences. I think any student who